So it's no surprise to anyone that Intel is facing some tough times with their dwindling stock prices and significant issues plaguing their existing Raptor Lake CPUs for 13th and 14th gen. And performance gains over the generations have been very minimal with any games coming at the cost of excess power consumption. And overall Intel's poor communication through PR channels about the issue and bare aid fixes in the form of microcode updates that only slightly address the issue means that Intel is really in some rough times right now. But what about AMD? AMD's dominant position in the market thanks to Zen 3 and Zen 4 in recent years means that AMD is kept one step ahead, although the recently released Zen 5 has also been somewhat of a disappointment with underwhelming performance uplifts and ironically issues related to microcode and software. But even despite that, AMD's new CPUs are still more efficient than Intel's chips and AMD overall is maintaining leadership and efficiency in gaming performance with their 3D vCache technology. But considering the disappointment of AMD Zen 5, does Intel have a chance to catch up? Arrow Lake represents Intel's next big chance to regain the high performance desktop market. And they really need this lineup to perform well in 2024. And here's why. If Intel stuffs up with Arrow Lake, they will have a pretty huge mountain to climb. With fierce competition from AMD, with the upcoming 9000 series X3D launching around the same time. Thanks to leakers, we've been able to see what the next generation Arrow Lake CPUs are going to look like in the specs department. And let's just say it's not super compelling, you can definitely tell that Intel is taking a step back, especially with the removal of hyper-threading. First and foremost, pretty much every SKU maintains the same core count with the 285k or the 14900k successor with an A plus 16 core configuration, the 265k with an A plus 12 configuration, and the 245k with a 6 plus 8 configuration. Now again, like I said, there's no hyper-threading here, it's been completely removed, which tells us that Intel is seemingly moving towards efficiency gains rather than just going full boil on increasing core counts or brute forcing performance. And these are going to have the Lion Cove P cores as well as the Skymon E cores which are shared with the Lunar Lake architecture. And Skymon E cores especially will offer up a lot of improvements which we'll get to a bit later. And Lion Cove P cores will also provide a bit of improvements there as well. Now looking at cache sizes, it generally is a bit more interesting as L2 cache sees a bit of an uplift from 25 to 30% across all three of the SKUs, which will improve responsiveness and reduce latency in certain applications. However, when we look at L3 cache, it remains the same except for the 265K, which drops down to 30 megabytes of cache compared to the 33 megabytes of L3 cache on the 14700K. Now again, there might be a reason for this. Maybe the trading off between different performance factors, like focusing more on lower latency. And what's also interesting is that they've dropped P-Core max frequency by 100 megahertz, again showing that Intel is likely focusing more on efficiency rather than raw speed. E-Cores peak up to 4.6 gigahertz. And what's also interesting is that it's the same across the board, across every SKU that's been leaked so far, meaning that Intel is likely to have a balance between P and E-Core performance. And these higher clock speeds indicate that these Skymon E-Cores ain't your grandma's equals. Which when we look at the architecture, you can see that Skymon equals get about a 68% IPC improvement. And when looking at some of these graphs, you can see that Skymon equals actually produce similar amounts of performance to Raptor Cove cores, so the cores contained within Raptor Lake at a lower power profile. Now, despite this, you can see that the maximum turbo power only dropped by about three watts down to 250 watts, going from 253 watts on the 14900K. And also base power pretty much stayed the same across the board, but most of the difference in power consumption comes in the 245K, as now the maximum turbo power sits at around 160 watts down from 181 watts, or about a 12% decrease. And as for the process node, well, Intel appears to be shifting away from its own Intel 20A process, and considering that Lunar Lake is built on TSMC, or, or TSMC's N3B node, or 3 nanometer, all signs point towards that Arrow Lake is going to be primarily using external partners or external foundries to build their next generation processes. However, there's still some uncertainty about what process node will be used for stuff like the GPU, SOC, and Interposer, or the base tiles, the stuff that connects all the different tiles on their heterogeneous design, which is what they call it. Now, in my opinion, this reliance on TSMC's 3 nanometer process could really indicate that Intel has realized this in-house process technology 
isn't really ready for the cutting edge performance in Arrow Lake. But we just have to wait and see, you, you know, nothing's confirmed yet. And as for the iGPU, not something that you should really care about in an upcoming processor, but it's important to point out. The Intel Arrow Lake CPUs or Core Ultra 200 will use Alchemist XC low power graphics iGPUs with only around four XE cores. So unlike Lunar Lake, which will use the next generation XE2 architecture with Battle Mage, they're instead opting for more of the cost effective Alchemist, you know, existing GPU architecture that they've got. Which I mean isn't surprising, you know, AMD has done similar things where they've used lower tier GPU architectures or GPU models for some of their desktop APUs and CPUs. And we'll touch on the performance of these iGPUs a little later as well. Now memory is also something that's interesting. In addition to DDR5, which will now be the standard for, you know, their new platform, and also DDR4 won't be supported anymore, so keep that in mind. Arrow Lake S will also support the new QDIM modules, up to 10,000 mega transfers. And if you don't know what QDIM is, basically it's memory modules that reduce latency by generating the clock signals directly on the memory modules themselves, which reduces latency, of course, and increases performance. And as with any memory band applications or games, this will definitely increase performance and also make it attractive for high-end desktop users. So that's the specs for the new Arrow Lake CPUs. And while nothing is confirmed, I just got to say a few things. Intel's naming schemes are really goddamn confusing. This whole Core Ultra 200 series is just absolutely stupid. I don't know why they chose to change their entire naming scheme. Like, why would they do that? The whole industry as a whole just seems to be following this stupid route. Making product names is just so absolutely confusing. Like, CPU naming schemes might as well be catching up with one of the naming schemes at this point. It's getting that ridiculous. They really should have just kept with the generational naming scheme, calling this generation 15th generation. It's not even that hard. I also thought the decision to reduce L3 cache on some SKUs and remove hyperthreading to be a bit controversial. But it's clear Intel is making key decisions here, focusing on efficiency rather than just brute forcing performance, which clearly indicates that Intel is resetting the market with their CPUs this generation. Now, as for performance on some of these upcoming SKUs, and well, it's pretty mixed to say the least. The best case scenario for some of these leaked CPUs compared to the last generation in single core is around a 12% uplift in single core performance, and a multi-threading is about a 10% uplift. And the 265K, well, that's a little bit more disappointing, only showing around a 9% uplift compared to the 14700K in single core, and, well, only about a 1% uplift in multi core compared to the 14700K, which does raise a few concerns. But when we compare the 9950X to the 285K, we can see that the 285K outpaces both in single threading and multi threading, which is definitely impressive, again, considering the fewer threads due to the removal of hyperthreading, which is a key thing to point out. Overall, the performance of lists when it comes to single and multi threading are pretty respectable, but they are no means groundbreaking. Intel has seemingly focused more on efficiency, and that shows in this performance, rather than pushing the boundaries of clock speeds. But the question is, is this all Arrow Lake has to offer? We'll have to wait and see. Now surprisingly, we haven't seen significant gaming benchmarks being leaked yet for Arrow Lake, which is pretty unusual, especially this close to launch. But Moore's Law is Dead did speculate that the 285K might struggle to beat even the 7800X3D, and also the 9800X3D, even with an ideal IPC uplift, with the 9800X3D widening that gap even further. Now, of course, we have to take this with a grain of salt as simulated gaming benchmarks, but this is assuming a perfect gaming IPC uplift, so pretty much the best case scenario for the 285K. But again, we'll just have to wait and see. Jumping back over to this article about the iGPUs, the Alchemist 4XE core GPU that we talked about, you can see gets performance on par with the GTX 1050 Ti. Now again, that's not like mind-blowing performance or anything, but for an iGPU with only 4 XE cores, it's pretty impressive, but again, not mind-blowing or anything. 
and it's most likely going to be solid enough for integrated graphics, especially considering most people are going to slap in a dedicated GPU anyway. Now pricing of these upcoming Arrow Lake CPUs have also recently leaked, and it's expected that the 285K will cost around $620 USD, which is about a 5% increase over the 14900K's MSRP. The 265K or the 14700K's successor also got around a 5% increase over the launch price of the 14700K at around $430 USD. The KF models had similar increases so we won't go over that. And the 245K or the 14600K successor got only around a 3% increase in price costing around $330 USD over the $319 14600K at MSRP. So overall, these leaked price suggests around a 3-5% to increase in price across the various Arrow Lake SKUs compared to their Raptor Lake equivalents, which represents a minor shift to pricing unlikely to deter customers away from the new chips. But again, there's still a major unknown here, and that's the pricing of the platform. The overall cost of both the new CPUs and the platform, and even like memory, is going to dictate the overall value of some of these upcoming chips, and we simply just don't know about that yet. Now of course these are going to offer competitive prices against something like the 9000 series, with the 9950X being a pretty fierce contender to the upcoming 285K, and so on and so forth. But some of the Zen 4 CPUs like the 7800X 3D might give these new Arrow Lake CPUs a run for their money. The 7800X 3D especially, priced at only 419 USD, is going to be definitely competitive. And the 7950X, 7900X and so on will provide substantial value over some of these Arrow Lake CPUs. And of course provide better value over the newer Zen 5 parts as we know. So let's take a step back. So here's what Intel must do. Intel must deliver significant performance and efficiency gains to justify higher prices. That's a given with any price increase. And of course there's still an elephant in the room and that's the platform cost with the new Z890 motherboards. Intel must ensure they have a balance between value and performance. Not to mention AMD's 9000 X3D series around the corner which Intel must be wary of. So overall, Intel has a lot on their shoulders. If they're truly set for an October 24 launch, they must cement themselves and their new platform any way they can, especially in pricing before 9000 X3D hits shelves in January next year. They must also deliver a product that regains customer trust, which is again hard to come by given their situation at the moment. But overall, I hope Intel is able to deliver here. A strong Intel is a strong competition between Intel and AMD and the industry as a whole. At this point in time, we really need something that will shift the market given the recent disappointments we've had from not just Intel, but also AMD with Zen 5. So anyway, that's all for today. Make sure to like, subscribe, and hit that notification bell. Also, make sure to watch this video on the screen right now.